Let's pray. Dear God, I need some help to preach. I wrote down some words, but I need you to make them more than just words. If I have anything worth saying, please open your ears to hear me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer. We need your help. Amen. How to pick a fight. Ten easy rules. Rule number one. Be sure to develop and maintain a healthy fear of conflict. Let your feelings bottle up, build up inside so that you are in an explosive frame of mind. Rule number two. If you must, stay up to rehearse some people. <laughs> Rule number two. If you must, state your concerns. Be as vague and general as possible. That way other people can't do anything practical to change the situation. Oh, now we have people looking at the other people. <laughs> Rule number three. When in doubt, assume, assume, assume. Assume that you know all the facts. You are totally right. Even if you don't know, you can probably guess. Rule number four, do most of the talking. The louder and more aggressive, the better. Remember, yelling shows you can. Rule number five, with a touch of defiance, announce that you're willing to talk to anyone who wants to talk about the issue, but don't start that conversation. Rule number six, latch onto any evidence you can find that shows that the other person is just jealous. Rule number seven, bring up old mistakes that they've made constantly. Judge them. Hold that high over their heads. It gives you a lever up. Rule number eight, keep track of angry words. In fact, keep score as many ways as possible. Rule number nine, <laughs> always view the issue as a win-lose struggle. Avoid possible solutions. Go for total victory, unconditional surrender. Don't get too many options out there on the table. And, <laughs> and rule number ten, remember, it's the other person's fault. Remind them of that often. I always worry with, with jokes like that that people might take it seriously. You know, if they're like listening on the radio broadcast or whatever, they tune in at the wrong time and they don't realize that that's a joke. That is terrible advice. That is how to pick a fight. <laughs> we fight about a lot of stuff. In the church, in our families, with our friends, online, with people we don't even know in the comment sections. We fight all the time. We bicker and we argue. And now there's, there's this old story about a, a pastor and the issue of infant baptism. You see, some people believe that you shouldn't baptize babies. You shouldn't baptize babies because they don't know what's happening to them. They, you need to wait till they're old enough so they can understand, then you can baptize them. And so there's kind of this back and forth depending on which church you're in. Do we baptize babies? Do we not? So somebody walked up to a pastor and he said, do you believe in infant baptism? The pastor kind of stared at the person and said, what are we talking about, unicorns? I don't just believe in it. I've seen it done. Today we're talking about controversy, conflict. Simply put, bickering, humans disagree. For every area of life, there is something to argue about. Literally, from the day we are born, we start arguing about disposable diapers versus renewable diapers, immunizations, how many do they need? How long do you breastfeed a child? And then as they grow, we start to argue about, well, how much do we expose our children to and how much do we shelter them? Do we use physical punishments or only scolding? Some of you have had these conversations, right? These are the things we fight about. And then as they grow, and they, 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 they get older, and they start to make their own decisions, we have questions about independence, about trust, about responsibilities. How much do we, how much do we let our children fail? And how much do we bail them out? If, <laughs> do we push them towards one type of job? Or do we let them follow their dreams, even if their dreams are really unlikely? We've gone through these conversations, we've gone through these arguments, and that's just in the family, right? In every aspect of life, there are those who think differently. From what food you eat, your hobbies, what you watch on TV, how you dress, how you manage your money, how you drive your car. There is someone, somewhere, who doesn't like it. Humans fight. We disagree. Life is a tapestry woven in many colors. And the truth is, we don't like all the colors. Now in America, many of us think 
the solution is easy. Just ignore each other. You know, stay out of my business. That's fine. You're, you're welcome to be weird. Just do it over there. Right? Get it off my yard. We think that individualism is the answer. Literally, our Constitution has understood that you have a right to pursue happiness until it gets in the way of somebody else's happiness. We think individualism is the answer. Isolation. But humans are not meant to be islands in the ocean of life. We are not meant to be alone. We have this innate desire to be in community. We want to be interacting with other humans. And when humans interact, they're going to fight. Today we're talking about how. So today is the final sermon in the series Lessons from the Letters. Each week we have, different, we have visited a different ancient city to see what we can learn from their struggles. We've been to Rome, Corinth, Philippi, and now we are in Colossae. I, I don't think I'm saying it right. Colossae something. Colossae. And we're trying to see what we can learn from this city. And so I said a couple of weeks ago, there will always be something to fight about in the church. And that's true. There will always be something to fight about in the church. They were fighting about stuff in the ancient world. We're fighting about stuff here in the modern world. And so we can start it in chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, For I want you to know how much I am struggling for you, and for all those in Macedonia, and for all who haven't seen me face to face. I want their hearts to be encouraged and united in love, so that they can have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself. The city of Colossae was going through some struggles. They were in the midst of some kind of controversy. And Paul is reaching out to his people. He's reaching out to them. He says, I want them to have, I want them to be encouraged in their hearts, be united in love. Now we can, we can spend some time going over all the different theories about what it is that they're arguing about. Some people think it was Gnosticism. Some people think it was Jesus, and whether he was human or God. Some people think it was faith, and whether it's what we do or what we believe that matters. But the truth is, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what they're fighting about. The connection between us here today and the city back then is the fact that they were fighting. They were going through some kind of controversy. You see, there's this, there's this tendency when we're arguing with people to demonize the other. And what I mean by that is we assume if somebody disagrees with us, well, they, they don't have all the facts. Or if they do, then they're an idiot. They're dumb. They don't understand. They're a fool. When we don't agree, we push people away. We polarize our arguments. It's easier that way. When we polarize an argument, it makes us feel better about the way we treat people. Which kind of shows us something about how we treat people when we fight them. I had a, a history professor who used to talk about controversy in the ancient world as like a, a big pendulum swinging back and forth. You've got the people on the extremes, right? The right side and your left side of every issue. And we in the, on the pendulum, we're kind of riding back and forth, trying to run away from both groups, trying to just find the answer to avoid the conflict. And demonizing the other, it comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. We assume the worst about people we don't even know because they disagree with us. We assume the worst about people we've never met because they disagree. You see, a lot of these things that we fight about, a lot of the issues, are very important to us. We consider that it's like it's a part of our identity. It's part of who we are. You know, it's close to home. And so when somebody challenges that, we get defensive. You know, and then we start attacking. You know what I'm talking about. We start attacking. They feel like a piece of our identity. For example, when the Protestants showed up, right, with this hundreds of years ago, right, they were Protestants, they broke away from the Catholic Church. There were literally Protestants and Catholics roaming around the European countryside, killing each other because they worshipped the God of love and slept in their way. Both Protestants did this and Catholics. Nobody's more or less to blame. This is terrible. This is embarrassing. Right? This is part of our history. It's just shameful. Paul is saying, no, no, no. I want you to be encouraged in your heart. I want you to be united in love even when you're fighting. You see, God lives in each of us. Verse 6 tells us, it says, as you have therefore been received, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. There is a peace of God, we call it the Holy Spirit, living in each of us. In Genesis, God created man and woman in his image. That's the phrase. And in Latin, we call that imago Dei. 
You are the image of God. You were created. You are a reflection of God. And it's, it's, maybe that makes us feel really good. I am I'm an image of God. But we have to remember the other side of that equation. You are an image of God. You have value because of God's love. Absolutely. But so does everyone else. You have value because God loves you. But so do your enemies. So do your teachers, your friends, your politician, your dentist, your favorite TV actors. We are, all of us, the image of God. We are, all of us, a reflection of God, loved by God. Now sure, some people reject that. Some people turn away from God, absolutely. Some people reject it, they fall away and they never come back. That's true. But the, the, the moment of redemption, that potential, that possibility is always there. God is always willing to welcome us back and that's what forgiveness is. He's always, if you just reach out and grab it, He's always willing to take you back. God's love is always available. God lives in us. So in verse 9 and 10 it says, For in Him there is the fullness of deity, dwells bodily God. Jesus is God. And you have come to fullness in Him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. When we recognize that peace of God that's in us, when we claim that, then we are complete. When we embrace that peace of God within our hearts, we are complete. And so here's what we do with that. Engage your world with Christ as your starting point. Engage your world with God as your center. When you come up against some issue, let your identity in Christ be your starting point, your motivation rooted in Him. You see, Jesus is the only constant in life. All this other stuff that comes up that we think is so important that we get all riled up about, Right? Politics, money, family, cars, sports, whatever, pets. Everything changes with time. Jesus is the only constant in our lives. Take comfort in your identity. You are a reflection of the Almighty. You are a reflection of God. When we face a challenge, a controversy, an issue, a fight, start with your connection to God. Remember who you are. That's step one. Remember who you are. Step two, remember who they are. Remember their identity. They are a child of God, just like you. Instead of demonizing, instead of pushing people away and assuming the worst, take a moment, walk a mile in their shoes, try to understand where they are coming from. Try to find that peace of God that's in them as well. Try to find that moment. Remember that God lives in them. Maybe it's ignored, maybe it's hidden, but if God can love them, if God can have hope for them, we better give it a try. If God can love them, then we better try. It's, here's a perfect example. Next year is election year, right? I swear we start this process sooner every rotation. Man, that's, we're already talking about this, right? It's like two years out, and we're still starting this conversation, right? Now, in politics, Democrats, Republicans, we love to demonize the other. It can get nasty. Now, I've never done this before. I've never been a pastor during an election year. I'm a little nervous. I don't know what's going to happen. Right? It gets, it gets nasty. But I'll tell you this. Before we get into all that, I don't care which side you are on, Democrat, Republican. I do care how you act on that side. Does that make sense? I don't care which side you are on. I care how you act on that side. Remember who you are. Remember who they are. Now it takes two things to make this happen. Time and space. It's jumping to conclusions, assuming. That takes no time at all. That's easy. That's instant. But it takes time to find God in somebody else, especially if we don't like them. It takes patience. We have to step back, take a look at them. Try and see them not as the devil, right? Try and see them as a human being that God loves. That's hard. That takes time. Sometimes we've got to give it some space. We've got to back off. You know, go somewhere, blow off some scenes, do something else. Right? They have, this happens with cops all the time. Right? If, you're too, if a police officer is too close to an investigation, they can't see it from all the angles, they take them off the case. They say, you can't do this. You've got to back up. You've got to step back. Remember who you are. Remember who they are. Give it some time. Give it some space. All right, so now, now we are ready for conflict. 
Our identity comes from God. When we are rooted in God, that becomes our core, our starting point. But in every single struggle, things get complicated. Emotions come up. It always gets sticky. It always gets ugly. And so Paul's not done. He says in chapter 3, verse 9, he says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have, you have stripped off the old self with its practices, and you have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the Creator. The image of the Creator. You are the image of God. Paul uses the metaphor, the, the analogy of clothing to talk about how we prepare for this life, how we prepare for arguments, how we prepare for controversy. Strip off the old self. You see, there is a difference between who you are and the clothing you wear. There is a difference between who you are at the core, a child of God, and the personality that we put on in the morning. There are things that we think are essential. It's that's just who I am. It can't be changed. Paul says that's nonsense. Verse 8, he says, But now you must get rid of such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth. Take it off. It's like dirty clothes. Take that off. Put on your new clothes. Verse 12 tells us, As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Here's the thing about clothing. It's designed to be temporary. It's not designed to last forever. They're human reactions, like, like anger. It's not meant to last. It's part of a process of becoming, of, of perfection. It's not meant to linger. You know, if you hang on to anger for a little bit too long, what happens? It turns into a, a grudge. It turns into like a poison pill that ruins everything. You know, if you hang on to anger, it's like wearing sweaty clothes a little bit too long. You stink. You need to change your clothes. You hang on to anger too long, you're gonna stink. It's designed to be temporary. The clothes that we put on are part of a process of perfection, of becoming who we're meant to be. For example, personal sharing time. When I was a teenager, I was part of the, the punk rock crowd. Right? That was my identity as a high school kid. And so the cool clothing for that crowd when I was in high school was the, the baggy, saggy, torn up jeans. The baggier, the saggier, the more torn up, the better. Right? I had a pair of jeans that are ripped from here all the way down, from the knee down, and then I put it together with safety pins. You know, because that was cool. Oh man, my parents hated it. And we all wore black t-shirts with a band, you know, like a white band print on the front. There were like six bands that you were allowed to wear, and that was, that was cool. And so the, oh, oh, and the long hair, lots of, like I guess that didn't go away. Still lots of bracelets <laughs> with the long hair, right? And the hair was always in your face. My parents hated it, but that was like bonus points to a high schooler, right? This, this is the life we lived. I, I needed to be unique. So I dressed exactly the same as all my friends. <laughs> I thought that was my identity. I thought I would always dress like this. This is, this is who I am, Mom. You just don't understand. Right? This is part of who I am. But then time went on. I grew up a little bit. You know, I matured. I met my wife. She taught me, put my pants up, put a nice shirt on, cut your hair. <laughs> and I think I'm better for it. <laughs> the temporary. It's not who you are. It's temporary. It is, it is a process. See, when we put God at the center of our lives, when we put God at the center of our lives, we are reborn. We strip off the old self like dirty clothes, take it out back and burn them. I think that's what I ended up doing with those jeans. <laughs> Get rid of them, right? The things we thought were a part of who we are, we need to let go, let God come in and clothe you in new clothing, in compassion, and patience, and humility, and meekness. We are reborn. Now with that comes a recognition. Reborn people, they're still learning. They're still in this process of renewal, right? And so with that, we, we start with love. But we're going to make mistakes. We're still figuring this out. And so with that love comes a need for forgiveness. That's essential. And not just one time. Right? We, we need to be known. A community of people who are reborn, a community of people who are gathering together trying to become better, trying to get closer to God, i.e. the church, we should be known for a habit of forgiveness. We should be known for a process of forgiveness again and again. The clothing is not permanent, it's a process, but we need each other. It says in verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. We are not islands in the ocean of life. We can't do this isolation, get out of my life, leave me alone thing. 
If we want to be part of this community, we have to teach and admonish one another. Now, there's better and worse ways to do that, and that's a whole other sermon, right? But we need to be willing to learn from one another. And it says, it keeps going, it says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do. See, here's where the rubber hits the road. Here's how a Christian handles conflict. It's no matter who, no matter what, no matter how many times, the process is always the same. Step one, remember who you are, a child of God. Step two, remember who they are, a reflection of God, an image of God as well. Remember who you are, remember who they are. Now we're ready. Good morning. We start with verse 14. It says in verse 14, Above all, clothe yourselves in love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Start with love. Don't demonize. Don't assume. Start with love. But what if I make a mistake? What if they make a mistake? What if I put on the wrong clothing? Back up one verse. It says in verse 13, Bear with one another. And if anybody has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Start with love. And when love fails, we forget. Lessons from the letters. Each week we've been talking about a different letter. When we talked about Rome, we talked about endurance. We talked about leaning on God and leaning on each other. Mutual encouragement. And then we moved over to Corinth. And we started talking about community. And we realized that even if you've got it all figured out, we need to be careful. We need to put other people first so that we don't make each other stumble. And then we moved over to Philippi and we saw the difference between fleeting joy, that temporary happiness that disappears, and the joy that comes from God. Joy that transforms into hope on the bad days. And we end with Colossae. Colossae, and we, we, we talked about which clothing we put on when the inevitable fight comes up. These communities, they're, they're hundreds of years old. Thousands, really, if you think about it. They're like 2,000 years old, give or take a couple of decades thousands of years ago, and yet their messages echo through the ages right here in the nation between Wesley and Adventist Church in 2015. We have something to learn from these people. So I leave you with this. May you never stop learning. Never stop growing. Never stop loving.